The shuttle training airplane was a very specially designed and specially developed version of the Grumman Gulfstream II and it was modified so that it flies exactly like the space shuttle. And we would have crews that came back from a mission and they'd say, well, what do you think? What was it like to fly the orbiter? And they'd say, I was so well trained. It flies just like the shuttle training airplane, just like the STA, so don't change anything. The, the STA itself was a very highly modified Grumman Gulfstream II. And the modifications that we had to do to it to make it fly like a space shuttle were very, very extensive. And we would buy uh, used Gulfstream IIs because all the engineering was on a G2. So for example, we couldn't use a G3 or a G4. It had to be a G2. Um, and it would replace, for example, the triple slotted Fowler flaps on the trailing edge of the wing with a simple flap, uh, meaning it didn't have slots in it. It just was a simple flap. But this was an unusual flap because it could go 20 degrees down. It could also go as much as 20 degrees up. And the purpose of it was to match the flight deck angle. The wing on a G2 is a long, slender, what we call a high aspect ratio wing. And the wing on the space shuttle is a short, stubby, very low aspect ratio wing. And with pitch angle changes, they behave very much differently. In order to make the G2 or the STA act like a space shuttle, frequently we'd be pulling the nose up and the flaps would be going up to kill lift, whereas normal flaps add lift. They'd be going up to kill lift so that we could match the flight deck angles of the space shuttle. The other, one of the other big modifications was it had special thrust reversers on it so that we could go to reverse thrust in flight as high as 95% power to give us the drag, simulate the drag that a space shuttle has. And then of course, a digital computer on board that took the pilot's inputs, took the airplane response and did something called model following to make the G2 or the SDA fly just like the space shuttle did. So very extensive set of modifications to make a shuttle training airplane. Well, it would, it would really get someone's attention the very first time they flew the thing because on a normal glide slope, we'd be at 20 degree dive angle. So looking out the forward windscreen, you can't see the horizon. All you can see out the forward windshield is ground. You're just looking at dirt as you're, as you're flying these approaches. Now that's on a normal approach. They would give us high energy uh, because they, they wouldn't, the instructors would not just set us up for a perfect approach. They'd set us up low and they'd set us up high. Well, when they'd set us up high, we'd be coming down 30 degrees sometimes. So really looking like a dive bombing run in this thing charging towards the ground and you'd hold this dive down till you got 1700 feet above the ground and finally you would start your flare maneuver. So it was kind of startling the first time a person ever saw it. We, we didn't really have uh, a nickname for it. We probably should have had one like, you know, the SR-71, they call it the Habu. Uh, we, we probably should have had some kind of a nickname for it, but it was either uh, the STA, where are you off to today? Well, I'm going to White Sands to go fly the STA, or I've got a, a session in the G2, uh, is what we referred to it as. So either STA or G2 was all we ever called it. Most of the training we did was just the pilots. So you'd have a, a commander, mission commander, go undergoing training and currency, and also the, the mission pilot. But frequently our mission specialists would come along with us. Uh, just because they wanted to see what it looked like, they wanted to experience it, and it was a lot of fun. Once you got over the, uh, the reaction of seeing nothing but ground out your forward windscreen, uh, and, and seeing that kind of a steep dive angle and seeing how fast the ground is coming towards you, once they got over that, it was really a lot of fun. So frequently our mission specialists would come along just for the experience. I got to fly both the, the T-38 that's on display out here uh, it had a different number then. It wasn't 999, it was, it was something else. But I've looked at the bureau number and it's in my logbook and I, I don't recall right now what number it had back when we were flying it uh, back at, at Johnson Space Center. Uh, and I've also flown 945, the shuttle training airplane 
uh, that we ha that we will have here on display, and it's it's a it's a little bit bittersweet actually to look at them and say, gee, they're on display, they're not being used for what they were intended for anymore, uh, just like the space shuttle isn't being used for what, it, for what it was intended for anymore, and they've all gone to museums. But at the same time, you have to say to yourself, it's wonderful that we can expose young people to this and old people to it as well, that we can show them the tools of the trade, if you will, the things that we use to, to maintain currency, the things that we did to learn how to fly space shuttle approaches, and it's going to be a legacy that, that I hope 100 years from now, kids come in and look at it and say, gee, that's how they trained. That's the way they learned how to do this. The men and women that piloted the space shuttle learned on these things, and here they are right in front of me for me, be, me to be able to learn something from them as well. So they are, they, it's a whole lot better than putting them in the boneyard out in, out in the desert somewhere, putting them on display where people can see them and learn from them. I hope we can put across the message to everyone that comes and looks at these things. The, the way that we had to train crews to fly a space shuttle. Because when you think about it, there was no one simulator that we could say, okay, here's the everything simulator for a space shuttle. There was no such thing. We had one simulator that had a motion base. Uh, that kind of similar to some of the little simulators that we have here at Space Camp at the Space and Rocket Center. And you could do one thing in them. So we could do launch training and we could partially simulate re-entry and landing training. And then we had another simulator that had the back cockpit, all of the, all of the systems, all of the uh, mechanisms that we would operate from the aft flight deck. And then it had sort of a simplified lower deck, not a very high fidelity at all. And then we'd go to the mock-up. We had a, a full-size mock-up of the space shuttle where we could train in the cabin and it had a rather high fidelity mock-up, but nothing worked. You couldn't turn on the computers, you couldn't turn on displays, you couldn't do things there. So what I'm beating around the bush at here is that the training for the space shuttle got done over here and it got done over here and it got done over here and over here, and you had all these different facilities, including uh, flying around the country, around the United States, to the researchers' facilities so that they could show us how their machinery operated and what it was there to do. And I'm hoping that we can get that point across. The STA was one facet of that, and that was our best, most high-fidelity approach and landing training that we got anywhere was in the shuttle training aircraft. The T-38s were another way that we could fly and simulate the approach, but you had none of the displays, none of the right flight controls, none of the things that you actually had in the, in the orbiter. And I'm hoping we can bring that to life by putting these things on display and showing where they fit in with the overall space shuttle training. Because I think, I think that'll be really interesting to our visitors to see that. I, I, I hope that all of the people out there thinking about contributing to this get a chance to come down here to the Space and Rocket Center and see the big eyes on the young people that walk through here and, and get their eyes opened even wider when they see what we do in space, what we have done in space, and look at what we have to offer here, not just to young people, but to old people as well. It's a real eye-opener to see the things that we do because we know how to work with physics and mathematics and science and the so-called STEM subjects. And Space Camp brings this alive to thousands of young people every summer and year-round for that matter. And I hope, I hope people that are thinking of contributing to this will have their eyes opened as well and say, if I really want to contribute somewhere where it's going to do an awful lot of good, this is the place.